Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I'm your host, Brett Gilliland, and today I've got Lauren Johnson with me. Lauren, how you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. You are a mental performance coach and a speaker. You own your own consulting company now and done some work with professional athletes, specifically even the Yankees and a lot of business leaders and Fortune 500 CEOs. And so a lot of stuff we're going to talk about today. So I'm really, really excited about diving into it. But you're up in Northern California. I uh, just came from old Tahoe. So that's a beautiful part of the country, isn't it? Uh, one of my favorites. Amazing. Does it get old being out there and in beauty of these mountains and these trees? And- <laughs> never. never. Absolutely never. Now I am still a little bit, of, it, it takes a drive for me to get to Tahoe, but man, I try and get up there as much as possible. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's amazing out there. Well, if you can, Lauren, why don't you give us a little lay of the land? What's kind of made you the woman you are today to come to that background and, and uh, kind of set us up on the right foot on who Lauren Johnson is? Yeah. Yeah, man. That's kind of a heavy question. Who <laughs> like how, Starting out how strong. I am. Uh, let's see here. We'll, we'll start with the easy stuff. Uh, grew up an athlete in an athlete household my whole life. Um, fell in love with soccer at a really young age. It was like, it it was a mixture of both fun and really challenging for me. So I completely fell in love with it. And the second I I started doing it, I was like, this is what I want to do. So originally I wanted to be a professional soccer player. That was my goal. Uh, you know, back in first grade, when they ask you who you want to like, what you want to become. Yes. Uh, and while school was fine and I was decent at it, it was really like sports that always, I was always drawn to sports in some way. And so as I went into, you know, my college, college years, not only did I play at the collegiate level, but I knew that past college, I wanted to work in some sort of sports. And so originally I actually wanted to be a physical therapist because I'm like, okay, this is, I can get the closest to working with athletes, you know, besides being a coach. Um, and this is really exciting to me. (laughs) Well, Then my senior year of college, I found sports psychology, actually after I became injured um, as an athlete and completely fell in love with it because the one thing I didn't love about physical therapy is I was like, okay, I love the connection with my clients, but I'm not very good at the medical side. Like, and it didn't excite me. Like I was like, this is not not my thing. Like I felt like it was a requirement to have this other piece of it. So when I learned, oh, there is an actual job that is all about your connection with the client and helping them to overcome these mental obstacles they're facing. Holy cow, that's for me. (laughs) So I uh, actually, my senior year, I decided to, I finished off my degree in kinesiology, minored in psychology, and then went full force ahead for a master's in performance psychology. And it's, you know, kind of led me down the path I'm on now. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So how did you, how have you built your quote unquote resume, if you will, right? Because I mean, Yankees, one of the most, uh, well, the, the winningest uh, organization in, in Major League Baseball history. I know you spent some time with them. So like, like, how does that happen? Like, so talk to our listeners and not necessarily, yes, it's the Yankees, but how do we go do something that may be bigger than what we think we could do and then believe it and go get it done? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, if you would have told me out of grad school that, um, in a couple of years time, you're going to work for the Yankees. I would have thought you were crazy, not because I didn't think I could do it, but because up until then, I didn't believe it was possible. Hmm. Um, I had a lot of people, uh, in grad school and otherwise, and I know a lot of grad students have this, uh, have had a similar experience where they're told like sports jobs are the hardest to get, like, don't even, you know, they, they kind of like steer you away from it. And I, part of me believed that. And part of me was like, ah, screw that. Like I can get this. So I, I graduated from my master's program and I had two job offers and, um, one, I I ended up taking one and and turning down the other. But the, the only thing about the one that I ended up taking was that it, um, it required like six months before I was going to be placed in an actual role or position. And it was very common for this role. I was, uh, that I had gotten, And so six months goes by and I don't hear anything. And at this time, mind you, I'm preparing for this. So I have moved out of my apartment. I think I was living with my grandma at the time. Like, and like I was living with my, which who, by the way, is like one of my best friends. One of the most incredible times of my life, which we can go back to that later, but she's amazing. However, I'm like living with my grandma. I am, I have a master's degree and I'm like, just kind of like, 
in limbo waiting to see where I'm going to be moving to all my stuff's in storage. And I remember I was, I was, uh, visiting my boyfriend at the time, but now husband, and we were driving up to Tahoe, believe it or not. And that's when I get this call and it was in response to an email I had sent. And the email was, Hey, just checking in six months has gone by. I haven't heard anything. Like when should I be expecting my job placement? And I got a response that said, we're sorry. The job is no longer available Mm. Mm. on the way up to Tahoe to have like a fun weekend with my boyfriend, you know, to be husband. And I was like in tears. Yeah. Just got kicked right in the teeth. Just devastated. Yeah. My whole, like all my plans were just uprooted and now we're supposed to go celebrate. (laughs) And I'm just like, I just cry. I just want to like crawl in a hole. And I just remember how upset, like devastated I was and thinking, I I can't even go back to the other job because it's six months has passed. They've already refilled, they've already filled the position. So I'm kind of screwed. So I, after, you know, having my own little pity party and, you know, being upset, I was like, okay, what am I going to do about this? So I ended up calling, you know, a lot of people that we actually talked about before this, uh, calling a lot of people that I knew in the field um, and people that, uh, you know, were mentors to me or were already working in pro sports. And I, you know, called them for advice, you know, is there any jobs available? And there was just nothing. And even when there were things, I kept hearing the same thing, Lauren, you just need experience. And which is a very frustrating thing to hear out of grad school. So I I'm, I'm now like my deadlines for my, for my, uh, student loans are approaching. So I'm like, well, I need to make money. I can't like sit around waiting for like these jobs to happen or get, get experience before I can start applying. So I ended up getting a job at Starbucks and, uh, it was really humbling, but I will never forget. My mom used to tell me, uh, she said, you are never too good for any position. It's great advice. You are never too good to work in a position you think you are never better than any other position out there. She said, there are times where you have to roll up your sleeves and do the difficult thing. And yeah, part of my ego was like, I don't deserve to work at Starbucks. Yeah. I, you know, at Starbucks was exactly what I needed. So I'm working there humbled by the whole thing. And one day this guy drives up in the drive-thru and we're chatting, like we're chatting it up and he goes, so are you in school? And it was a common question. Most people were, uh, but I said, no, actually I just graduated. And he's like, great. Would you get your degree in? And I like was so proud to tell him, I was like, oh, I got in performance psychology. And this guy just starts laughing in my face, like full on belly laughing. And I'm like, oh, so, this is great. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, do I have something on my face? Like what's, what's so funny. So finally Um, you know, I I have no problem with confrontation. So finally I just asked him, I was like, what's so funny? And he goes, Oh, (laughs) you got one of those degrees you'll never use. Oh. And it was like a gut punch. Here I am already feeling like I am not in the position I should be. And now somebody's telling me like, there's a chance you'll never leave here because you're not going to do anything with that. And I was so pissed. Like I walked away, somebody else had a hand of his drink, but it got worse as the day went on because I started ruminating on this. And have you ever had that where somebody says, something Oh yeah, you, it, it sticks with you and you just keep replaying it like a broken record. And yep. every time you replay it, you re-experience all the emotions all over again. So that's happening. And then I get mad because I'm mad. Cause I'm like, Lauren, this guy, you don't even know this guy. Like, why do you care? Like, why are you giving him all this power over you? And that's when I had this like aha moment. And I realized I wasn't upset because he was rude. I was upset because he was right. Yeah. That's what happens a lot of times, doesn't it? The, the hardest feedback is the, and the feedback, even if in a spouse, right? Gives you feedback. You may be mad, but you're mad because it's true. Yeah, because there's a part of it that was 100% true. Yeah. And <clears throat> I'm not sure if it came from anybody close to me, I would have paid attention to it the same. And it, what it forced me to do is it forced me to look in the mirror and go, all right, so if that's true, what is your response going to be? 
because I realized like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make much progress if I just turn around when I'm faced with adversity. Right. And that's essentially what I was doing. And so that day I Googled how to start your own consulting company, started my own consulting company, um, worked the earliest shift at Starbucks. It was, I had to get up at 2.30 AM. My shift started at 3.30, worked until 12. And then from about 12 to four, I would go on LinkedIn and send out messages, cold calls, pick up phones. Like, and I, my goal was just to get in front of anybody that would allow me to work with them because they knew that if I could get in front of them and I could show them the value of what I had to offer that more, more than likely I'm going to get a client out of it. And if not, at least maybe I'll get a referral. Right. And that's what I ended up doing. And little by little, I started gaining some traction and people would see my work and they would refer me to somebody else. And then that person would refer me to somebody else. So suddenly I built a, you know, very humble company, but a company enough to pay my bills where I didn't also have to work at Starbucks. Right. And after a year's time, I actually had some friends that worked in baseball that, um, that sent me the job opportunity from the Yankees when it came out and, um, I interviewed and I got the job. Boom. Podcast over dedication, <laughs> perseverance, uh, courage. Right. I mean, I think a lot of similarities. So I was 22, 20, I guess, 23 years old when I started in the financial wealth management business. Right. And, and still to this day now, 20 plus years later, I'll have, I'll talk to young folks and they're like, yeah, but who's going to give their money to a 23 year old? I'm like, yeah, you're right. Who is going to do it? But I think you just, sometimes ignorance can be blessed too. Right. To where here I was in this new town, St. Louis, I wasn't from here. You know, here you are building a consulting company, you're cold calling people, you don't even have any clients that you're consulting with or that you're helping performance mindset, right? But yeah, you had a belief, you had a vision, you had action, which is one of the circuits of success, hence the name of the podcast. And so I could go on and on about that stuff. But I think sometimes, not sometimes, most of the time, in my opinion, you've got to take action without the answer. Do you agree with that? Yeah, it's actually the core of what I built my company on is this idea that you become elite by choice, not by chance. I could have made a totally different choice. Yeah. I could have chose to stay exactly where I was and, and allowed fear to take the wheel and allowed other things and outside circumstances to, to make decisions for me. But that's the thing about being a victim in your, in your situation, whatever situation you're in, when you're a victim, you're pointing outside of you. And when we point outside of you, we give our power away because now we're requiring things externally to change in order for our situation to change. And where, sure, you could argue it was not my fault that suddenly the job wasn't available. You can argue all of that, but what good is that going to do for the situation I'm in? Like, it's not going to do any good. It's the question is like, okay, well, now what are you going to do about it? Because Mental performance is oftentimes about accepting your reality and choosing your response. And the reality is your reality isn't always great. Right. <laughs> Sometimes it sucks and you don't have to like it. That's the thing. A lot of people are like, well, isn't accepting it like accepting defeat? No, it doesn't mean you have to like what situation you're in, but what you're doing is that you're accepting the fact that this is the reality you're being faced with. And now you have a choice to make on how you're going to respond to it. Yeah. And I talk about that with attitude, just, just simple with that. Like this morning, I don't know about you. I have to have an alarm go off, right. To get me up. I, I I'm a good sleeper, um, but I have a choice, right? We all have a choice every single day. And to your point, choice on to be successful or not, right. It is, is a, the, cho the word choice for me is a big, powerful word. Like I love that word because it is nobody else's choice, but Lawrence or, but Brett's to choose how today is going to go. Does that mean everything's going to go great? Does that mean every voicemail is going to be perfect? Every email is going to be here, you know, here's millions of dollars or here's this big consulting job. No, it doesn't mean that, but it's how we choose to live that reality, right? And how you do something with it. And so I call it the bounce back theory. And you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the, the most successful people in my experience, they bounce back from defeat quicker than others, right? You had your pity party, you called it. It's exactly what I call it. You had your pity party. Some people's pity parties last five minutes. Some people's last, you know, a couple hours. Some last a couple of days. Some last a month. Some last a year.
but the most successful people bounce back quicker from defeat. Thoughts on that? Oh man, I I, I love this because uh, a lot of times it's actually, it's funny. I actually have this sticky note. So for anybody that's actually watching, I will explain it for those that aren't, but this is how I describe, I was start describing this to somebody, the difference between like an amateur athlete and a professional athlete. Mm. And when it comes to their mentality, that the top squiggly line has very high highs and very low lows. And the bottom one, there are still highs and lows, but it's the in-between that shifts. And that mental performance doesn't make you invincible. It makes you adaptable. And this is a good example of what that looks like is that professional athletes, they still go through highs and lows of performance, but they're more adaptable when those things occur. And so therefore the highs aren't so high and the lows aren't so low. And so they're able to establish more consistency over time and more consistency within their results. And so I could not agree more with you. I think that's a really important point. Yeah, I'm looking for a book. Um, what's the name of it here? It takes what it takes. Have you have you heard? Have you read that book? Yeah, by Tre- or Trevor Moad. Yeah, we yeah. actually. God my, rest his soul. I, by the way, my director um, at the Yankees and him are best friends. Or we're best uh, friends. So yeah. they, uh, he he frequented the, the Yankees quite a bit. Okay. Great, yeah, so great you, it made me think of that when you when you when you showed your lines, right? And he talks about basically, I'm I'm paraphrasing here, but taking the emotion out of it, right? Don't let your highs be too high. Don't let your lows and be what's he call it, neutral thinking. I think if I remember correctly, but it, but it's true. But I can also be guilty of that from a uh, raging optimist standpoint. I like to live in that moment because it can propel me onto something else, even though that thing didn't happen. I like to think it's going to happen for a while. And something else may happen. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. It's probably a little confusing, but I, I think I don't like to go into the into the depths. But you certainly do it on a on a journey of entrepreneurship for sure or sports. Oh, entirely. And really, what that really what we're talking about here is our relationship with our emotions, our relationship yeah. with our responses. Because emotions, you're right, they're not they're not bad. Feeling positive, feeling optimistic, or even feeling angry or upset. There could be benefits to both of those things. But the question is, where does the benefit lie? And for a lot of people, when they ride those highs or when they ride those lows, that it really becomes uh, a something that gets in the way of their ability to perform consistently. And so one, you know, one great tool, again, that Trevor Moed talks about is neutral thinking, is being able to detach from that. That's a great skill to have. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have emotion because pain is a catalyst. It's a catalyst for change. It could be a catalyst for growth. Um, and then, you know, optimism and positivity can be a great motivator. And when we are building momentum, oh man, there's a lot of science behind momentum and motivation. But what we do know is that there's a balance between the two. When we look at actually our neurology and our chemistry is that too much of either can become a really bad thing. And we have to be able to have the balance in order to sustain it long-term. Yeah. And, and I think, so when I hear that, I heard you say that motivation, I use that word. Let's talk about purpose. I mean, motivation, in my opinion, you talk about, like, I know you're a speaker, but I think you're a speaker for change is yeah. the way I would say it, right? Is for actually, let me get this meat and potato thing. Let me take one nugget and implement it in my life. Then there are motivational speakers, right? You're ready to run through the brick wall when they get done speaking at the conference. But then you leave the conference, you go to the airport or you drive home wherever you're at. And that motivation has gone by tomorrow, right? So go ahead. I was just saying, I love you for saying this because I, the amount of times that people are like, oh, you're a motivational speaker. I'm like, no, no. not exactly. There's a difference. No, I, there, there is a massive difference. And, and, yeah. and I wanted to make sure I say that out of respect for what you're doing it is for me, there's motivation. Motivation is great, right? We need it. We got to have it. Um, but there has to be purpose, right? And you can probably see this on this on the or on a microphone, F greater than P. People listen to this probably get tired of hearing me, hear me say it, but future greater than your past. That's my personal mission statement. That's our firm's mission statement is helping people achieve a future greater than their past. And for me, what I had to find now, I'm 44 years old. When I started, when I was 23, I started on motivation, right? The conferences, the books, the things I needed, but now it's purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So when you hear that, what comes to mind for you? Oh, many things, many things. I can go down so many, so many uh, paths with this one, but I'll start with this is that I agree with you. Motivation is, uh, I I always think of it kind of like a power plant. Power plants don't have energy. They generate it. 
And so motivation is often, uh, we, we treat it as something we either have or we don't, but really it becomes generated with action. And a lot of times it comes after the fact. And the thing I hate about motivation is that a lot of people use it as a prerequisite. Like, oh, I have to feel this way yeah. in order to act this way. And there was actually an example. I was uh, working with a golfer and this day in particular, I was just out observing one of his tournaments and we're out there and he, uh, he's having like a bad day. Like <laughs> you, you can kind of see, you can see the frustration building and building. And, you know, I, I watched him, you know, three putt and he's pissed. And so he grabs, oh. he throws it down. He literally like throws his putter to the ground, go, goes over like pulls out his driver and his caddy's like picking up his stuff like you know yeah. as he's as he's doing this and like literally almost runs to the next hole and i'm having to like <laughs> jog to yeah. keep up he he goes through every like literally abandons his routine entirely yep. puts on the ball swings and we watch as it goes directly into a hat into a hazard yeah yep we i mean hello. i've done it we, yeah, right. I was like, I from probably did in Tahoe there, last like, week, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right, Edgewood. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so he was so pissed. He he walked off and and quit. Oh wow. And I uh, I gave him a space for a little bit till he calmed down, and then we sat down to talk about it. And I was like, Hey, what what happened back there? And he goes, I don't think you understand. He goes, I hate losing. That's just how I am. Mm, I love that. I actually hate that statement. It's just how I am, but go ahead. Me too. So you and I are the same with this. And I said, bullshit. And he's like, he kind of like, looks like stops for a second. I like shocked him. And I said, that's not who you are. That's who you're choosing to be. Mm. I said, you can be angry and still keep your cool. You can be upset and still maintain composure. I said, you can be fearful and still act in a way where fear is not in the driver's seat. I said, your feelings and actions do not have to match to coexist. And I think it was the first time he had heard that. Yeah. And up until that point, he believed like a lot of us do is we fall it we somehow like along the along the path of performance we believe we have to feel some way to act some way and it's complete crap you can feel one way and act entirely different it's hard to do sure but it's not about like faking it till you make it it's learning to behave it even when you don't feel that way yeah that's that great. is discipline and that is high performance I'm writing that one down. Behave it even when you don't feel like it. Because you're right. I mean, I grew up in, a, in an environment that was the old fake it till you make it type thing, right? And it's like, I never connected with that. Um, but you hear it. And then you somehow in your 20s, you start to believe that, you know, so somebody driving down the road, listen to this, don't fake it till you make it. Like you just said, behave it, right? Behave the way, even if you don't want to. And, and I talk about, again, attitude, your belief system, and your actions ultimately get your results. That's the circuit of success, right? That's what this show is all about, is your attitude, beliefs, actions get your results. There's a lot of things in between there. But when you have those things, that, again, back to that motivation and that purpose, I think you got to dig deep and find out why in the hell are you doing what you're doing? And if you don't know the answer to that, I don't know what to tell you. And you know what? Most people don't have that answer. Right. When I meet with a lot of people, like I'll give you a good example. I was working with a CEO up in Canada recently. And there's a lot of things we are working on in general. Um, and one of the things is he wants to exit his company within three to five years. And it was funny because he didn't say that originally. Originally, he said, oh, I want confidence. I want this. I want to be able to walk into a board meeting and this, 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 fill in the blank. And it just, anybody that knows their why can spot when somebody thinks they know it, but they really don't. Yeah. And it's because what a lot of times we have like the surface why, and there's nothing wrong with, by the way, having a why that's temporary or that can carry you through today or tomorrow and it being more surface level. There's a place for that. But when we're looking for our true why, our true purpose, it, what it really does is it is a couple of layers deeper. And it oftentimes takes 
somebody else to reflect back to you and help us get there. So I asked him, I was like, that's not it. And he was like, what do you mean? How can you tell me that that's not it? I was like, because it's deeper than that. And so I kept asking, like, what do you want? And he would tell me, and I go, no, what do you want? And in the process, and I actually learned this from my good friend, Nick Cavuto, that in the process of just asking, what do you want time and time again, after a minute, you'll start to see us diving deeper into layers. And what we learned is that he didn't want, he didn't want what he wanted just so that he could feel good about himself walking into a meeting. He wanted what he wanted because in two to three years time, he wants to exit his company so that he can spend more time with his children yeah. so that he can be the dad that picks them up after school. And there is a legacy he wanted to be able to leave. And so when we really dove deep and understood that his whole energy shifted. And the reason why this is important is because when you're speaking to your why, you're speaking to the part of the brain that is responsible for decision-making. And so that's why when you don't feel like doing something and you go, well, I should, because I just need that confidence. You're not like jumping off the couch to do it. But when you connect to something greater than you, like your family, your legacy, the example that you're leaving, suddenly you go, I got to get up. Yeah. But I think the the reason people don't do that though, in my opinion, is it's scary, right? Because once you admit it, and I always say peel on the onion layer back, like you're talking about these layers, right? Yeah. So once I peel that back and now I've kind of, uh, I always say Pandora's box, everybody's got the box and I got a key and I got to unlock that key to let this thing out. Right. And so we do that with clients. What's important about money? Well, I just want to be secure. Now what's important about being secure, right? What's, and then, and you just keep going and asking them questions back about what they just said. And then it's, it's not every time, but it, it, you'd be shocked at how many times next thing you know, we're grabbing Kleenexes because somebody's crying. Right. Yep. And, and yep. that's the job is to tie it back. But it's very scary because once you admit it, now the fear comes in and then the mind, in my opinion, is made to protect ourselves, right? Our parents try to protect us as kids, we try to protect our own kids. And, and so the fear comes in there and it says, man, I just admitted this thing. Now I got to go do it. What happens if it doesn't happen? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And that, and that, I mean, I, have you experienced that before where maybe like even your why or even some of the goals that you've set have, have scared you like fear? For sure. You had, well, I've even had the thought of like, who in the hell do you think you are? Right. Like, why, why, like the future greater than your past? What, what in the hell thinks you, what makes you think, Brett, you can make somebody's future greater than their past, right? And, and you have to fight through that demon earlier. And I do think it comes with the experience because I've had different mission statements over my life or different purpose statements. But I can honestly say this is the first one that was the, the real, 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 real one. Like it's what I get up to do every single day. And I think I've eliminated a lot of other negative emotions in my life knowing that future greater than your past purpose, right? But there are lots of things that scare you. Oof. Ooh. Yeah. And I, I resonate with that because, um, some, I remember one time I was explaining, I was talking to, you know, something, something along this very similar lines that we're talking about with, um, a player from the Yankees. He goes, well, you're not allowed to think that way. Like you're a mental coach. Yeah. And I was like, That's precisely the reason why I think that way. Right. I was like, because how could I teach you the things that I do if I haven't gone through it myself? Yep. When people ask me, Lauren, like, why do you, why do you love this field so much? The answer is because I was the athlete that needed it. Yeah. I was the person that constantly got in my own way that I thought if I wasn't perfect, then I wasn't worth shit. Like I had all of these things that actually led me to this field because I needed it. Yeah. And I think we continue, of course, it, it evolved from being a soccer player to now, you know, uh, about to be a first time mom. And I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And I'm right. terrified. And there's a lot of fear associated with it. And there's changes sure. that are happening that I'm like rejecting. And so the, the different chapters in your life will, will require different mental skills or iterations of them. And I need it the most. And so I don't teach anything that I'm not willing to do myself. Yeah. But with that, I think too, is that let's pick the mom. Obviously I'm not a mom, but I am a dad. Yeah. I'm a dad of four. 
And I think that so many times, whether it's business, parenthood, whatever it is, we just think we got to know, right? I remember driving home the first time you guys will probably experience this. You drive home. We had to drive home on an interstate with our first baby. I'm 10 and two. I'm going like 45, you know, I'm a fast driver. Right. And I'm going like, these people are freaking crazy, you know? And it's like, <laughs> it doesn't come with a rule book. Right. Dealing yeah. with a pandemic running a company didn't come with a rule book. Right. Striking out 37 times in a row doesn't come with a rule book. But that's where, in my opinion, faith in a higher power, but faith in yourself, your belief system, your process, that's what has to come in that we as a human being, like, like advice to you, right, is you have, and I know you know this, I'm speaking to the coach here, but the point is you have to have faith that it will show up. The rule book will show up in how to be a mom, right? And you will figure it out and how to be a mom times two, or in my case, the dad times four, and it just shows up, but you got to believe it and you got to have faith in that. I know. I love that you said that. And I'm, and it's a reminder that I constantly need. So thank you for sharing that because I will never forget when I first, uh, you know, found out that I was pregnant and we were, you know, body changes are happening and I'm yeah. like rejecting them because I've been <laughs> like super fit athlete my whole life. And I'm yeah. like, what's happening? What is that? <laughs> yeah. Like, I know. I, it's like my body's so foreign to me. Um, as I had a friend and I texted her, I said, Hey, and she's a good friend of mine since college. She's had, she's now on her second kid. And I, I texted her, I said, the first time you got pregnant, did it feel like somebody just dropped you in the middle of the ocean and you had no idea what direction to swim in? And she's mm -hmm. like, absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think that that analogy doesn't, isn't just for pregnancy, but it's for a lot of other things in life. Like you had mentioned is that sometimes the best lessons in life are the ones where you feel like you are lost in the middle of the ocean and you do not have a clue of what direction to go in. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the exploration, right? The only way that you start to learn what direction is the right one or not is by exploring it and by choosing one and going. And then it may require a course correction. It may require turning around. You might get lucky the first time and go, ah, nailed it. But yeah. how are you to know? And so I do think that some of the best lessons do come from that degree of discomfort and, and honestly, like complete and utter vulnerability. Yeah. Well, I think it's learning too, right? And it's, it's okay to make a mistake, whether again, in business or in, in I mean, hell, an parent, I make mistakes every damn day, you know? And it's like, but you got to learn from them. And we got to learn from those mistakes and then do something about it to not do it again. But again, I will do it again. I still make the same mistakes. Yeah. If you're, if you're constantly making the same mistake, you're not learning. Yeah. If you never make new mistakes, you're not growing. Yeah. And so one of those, it's one of those, you know, paradigms that, you know, we want to pay attention to because man, we can get in a cycle of just not making any updates. Yeah. But then if you're so, but at the same time, understanding that mistakes are a part of the process as you're, as you're growing and as you're developing. Yeah. So what would it be if I followed you around, uh, you know, for a week, a month, whatever, pick your time frame. I followed you around and I said, okay, I'm going to find these one, two, three, four points. I know Lauren Johnson will never miss. What are those things? It's mm, a great question. Um, I don't know. I have to think about that. What points, one, two, three points, I don't know. Ah, one of the things I kind of live and breathe by is I think that there's so much power in any moment by understanding where your control does and doesn't lie. It's a very foundational principle, um, you know, in the sports psychology field. And the reason is because I think that, you know, especially as a young athlete, I gave my power away a lot. Yeah. And when you attempt to control things that you can't, it ends up controlling you. And that's what happened is I was being controlled by all these outside circumstances. I was being controlled by, you know, other people's opinions of me or things like, you know, jobs falling through, you know, a lot, yeah. a lot of things that were totally outside of my control. I would lend so much of my mental currency there. And so one of the things that is so foundational in my every single day and in terms of dealing with any adversities or struggles or even decisions I'm making is I go back to kind of this idea of understanding where my control does and doesn't lie. Because I think a lot of times it became such a default setting 
to just, if I didn't like it, that was the thing I focused on. And it be, it's, you know, that negativity bias that our mind, yeah. it's like so attracted to. And so for me, one of the things without fail is, uh, is I, I will always know where my power lies. And if I get upset at something about something, which trust me, it happens. You can ask my husband, um, <laughs> but that's Especially always when you're pregnant. Yeah. Oh, let me tell you about that. Uh, however, but what always happens is that there's a little, I give myself a little bit of time to be upset. Um, but my bounce back's pretty quick yep. and it always starts the catalyst for the bounce back always begins with that question yep. is where does your control lie and where doesn't it? Yeah. And what does that mean for your next step? Well, and we talked about that earlier, right? The bounce back theory, as I call it, I just was speaking to a group of people, young, young professionals I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, maybe. And and that's, that's the advice. Like, how do you get over disappointment? And for me, it's be disappointed, have my pity party, be pissed off. I mean, you, I mean, be absolutely pissed because you're, you're a golfer guy. I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose. My wife and I will race around the yard just to not lose. Right. I mean, it's, we're competitive. Our kids are competitive. And, and but I guess my point is, is again, faster, but put the game plan together. So if I didn't like that thing that just happened, then for me, I go to my black journal with an ink pen and my mind, and I put together the game plan that's going to get me out of that shit that I don't want to deal with right now. Oof, yeah, it's so true. There's, you know, my husband, I, uh, he, his head's gotten a little big, uh, because of this. So, uh, I, nobody send this to him, please. He already okay. ever given him enough credit for this. However, it's important for people to hear this because it honestly impacted me um, a lot. And it happened not long ago. And he asked me a question and what it did is it took me out of the moment that I was in it gave me a third party perspective. And it's a powerful question that stuck with me that I ask constantly. And when I'm upset or I'm in, you know, frustrated or something happens, the question I often like to ask besides where does my power lie and where doesn't it is what typically helps in moments like these. Mm. And he posed that question to me once when I was upset and what it did is it suddenly made me zoom out because right when we're in our emotions, we are so in them and sometimes we identify closely with them. And this gave me a moment to almost have that third party perspective where I could zoom out and look at my situation. And then I could actually reflect on past experiences and what helped. And then what my brain naturally did is what might help now. And what I realized in that moment, the answer at that moment was, giving myself like a 24 hour period to just be upset, but not address this yet. And then come back after I was, you know, I had created space from the emotion. I'd created space from the initial shock and then I could respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. And so that's an, that's a question I offer to you and to the that's audience. That's a great because, question. Because it really, it really makes you again, like you said, creating a future better, greater than your past it makes you think on your past in order to create a better decision for the future. Yeah. And I think coaching is a big part of all this too, right? I mean, I, I had a coach for years and you look at, pick your favorite athlete, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, Michael Phelps, Tom Brady. I mean, Tom Brady's got an entourage around it, right? And it's, it's people around you that, and, and to your coach that or to your golfer that you ask him questions, you need to hear that stuff and you'd be smacked in the face sometimes and wake up and ask questions that are hard to ask to ourselves. So for our listeners, I would tell you, find a coach. It doesn't have to be a lot of money, find somebody, right? Maybe it can be a lot of money depending on their budget, but find somebody you can go to, to get help, to ask you these questions and go through that. Would you agree with that? I would assume so be based on your, what you do for oh my a living. Gosh. But, yeah. I just had a call with my coach earlier today. I have, yeah. I have two coaches that I use right now, you know, for different reasons, but I, and I invest a lot of money in coaching yeah. because I see the value in it yeah. and yeah. every coach themselves, by the way, needs a coach. So yeah. if you are a coach saying like, oh, I don't need it. Cause I am a coach BS. Yes. Right. All we all do. You know why we all have blind spots yeah. and there are, there are these three areas that I actually created a video about this last week that, um, elite performers, you know, do differently than, uh, than average performers. And it's, it's this idea that number one, they don't play victim. Okay. They're mm. not sitting around feeling sorry for themselves. Number two, they under, they're a lifelong student. And so they're constantly trying to learn and develop. So one of the things when you're like, if we followed you, what's something you wouldn't miss is I'm constantly learning. 
So whether that's reading books, whether that's taking a course, whether that's being coached or applying something new, like, you know, homework that my coach gives me, um, which by the way, I'm in a very uncomfortable position right now with learning a new skill. (laughs) And so I felt (laughs) like I was taken back to like a beginner again. So thank you to one of my coaches for that. Um, And so the being a student is huge. And then the third thing is they, they understand the value of who you surround yourself with. And so they surround themselves with not people that necessarily are yes people or just will agree with them, but other like people that also want to improve themselves. And so I, I, this is so important for me. And it's been so important. Like for the last five years, I've noticed, um, is just who I surround myself with and who I choose to spend time with my proximity to certain people. It matters. And it's thousand percent. It's become more important the older I've gotten. We, I just talked about this. Um, I don't know if it was on a podcast or somebody else, maybe uh, somebody an advisor in our office. But you, you know, you can feel somebody's presence, positive or negative, right? I think John Gordon, who we talked about, I think before we started recording, he talks about in the energy bus. You know, as a fifteen feet radius that you can feel somebody's presence, uh, positive yeah. or negative. Get rid of the negative vampire, right? Stick around the positive people, and and, and it's. I'm lucky that my friend, I shouldn't say lucky. It's probably been done this way because of who we are and our values connection, but my friends lift each other up. One is not jealous of somebody else's success. And if somebody does something, freaking high five, let's go. Like, that's awesome. And that's how it should be. And I understand that that's not how the world entirely operates. I realize that's not everybody's reality, but you're a hundred percent right. Like if your response to somebody winning is like, I have to pull them down. Like we, you need to look in the mirror. Yeah. And I think we've all had that experience before. If we're all honest with ourselves for other reasons, whether it's jealousy or, you know, fill in the blank. However, the best, like you will never find somebody who is doing well for themselves and working hard, pulling somebody else down. Yeah. It's just, that is not allowed in my circle. If you do that, that's fine. That's the, but that is a reflection of you, not me. And my proximity to you is going to change as a result of it, because I need to be surrounded by other people that want to see me win. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't be honest with me or give me feedback sure. and maybe I disagree with feedback. That's not what I'm saying, but we all know those people that are, uh, that are negative just to be negative. And I think Justin Stewart does a really good job of explaining this. And he says, it's the difference between fountains and drains. There are fountains in our lives. Those are the people that you call, you know, when something good happens, you want to call and share it with them. Yeah. They're going to fill you up. And then there are drains. And those are people that they're calling you and you're like, Oh, I don't want to answer that. So good. (laughs) Yeah. And so it's like, it's, I think it's important to understand who are the fountains and drains in your life. And sometimes you can eliminate the drains entirely, but for those people that you can't eliminate, then the question is, how can you change your proximity? Because proximity is power. The closer somebody is, the more that, again, you can feel that energy and it can actually impact you versus maybe you just need to create some distance. Maybe you're just not available this Friday or this this weekend like you usually are. Well, and the power of no is huge too, I've learned. It's been a tough one for me, but one I've gotten better at and exercise a little bit. But I also think that you, you collectively, when you're building it, and especially in the early days, you got to say yes to a lot of things. Like I did, this is four years ago, but I just remember one of the, I did 40 things I learned in my first 40 years. Right. And, and one of them was, I said, take the coffee meeting, just take it. Like, I, I don't know, maybe something good comes out of it. Maybe it's a complete waste of time. Maybe a connection of a connection of a connection that I won't know about till five or seven or 10 years from now happens. I don't know. So I, I struggle with it as well. I, I mean, I, I'm pretty darn good at saying no now, but I think in the early days when you're on the grind and I'm still on a grind, don't get me wrong. But my point is, is that you got to take the coffee meeting sometimes, but then also be very protected, right? So I call them F to the fifth power, my faith, my family, my fitness, my firm, and my fun. Those five Fs, if I can decide based on this thing coming at me, Look at it through a lens of one of those five things. If the answer is hell yes, let's go. If it's no, then let's we're saying no, right? But it's got to move the needle in one of those five areas. So do you, do you have a decision-making process like that or anything similar to that? You know, I, I do. I have, I have a decision-making process in my business. And then when it comes to my friends, 
it's a very different decision making process. But sure. I would say that in terms of my business, I have I have an incredible business strategist that I work with. Um, because it turns out in a grad school, they teach you psychology, not business. So <laughs> that's an area that I was like, yeah. I need help in. And so what we've done is actually, I think, I think creating a system or a filter first starts with clarity. Because once you've gained clarity, then you can apply the filter that is in alignment with that. Yeah. I think where I struggled to say no before is I wasn't always clear, but I could feel the alignment shift, but I didn't anticipate it. Yeah. And so I would say no, say yes to things I should have been saying no to. And so now the filter actually comes from the things that I have actually set for my goals. I've created a 10-year plan, a three-year plan, a one-year plan, a six-month plan. And when those things don't align with those, that's where I have to say, okay, it's kind of like that, that story about the British rowing team, you know, will it make the boat go faster? And it filters your decision-making because if going to the bar does not make the boat go faster, then they're not going to go. That's and so right. for me, it's kind of like asking that same question to myself, like, will it make the boat go faster? And if the answer is no, I don't do it. I love it. I love it. All right. Now here we have a little fun. I'm going to steal your cell phone from you. Okay. Now besides email and calendar, because that's boring and you got to have them for work. Um, what's the one thing that I cannot delete on your cell phone that you got to have just in your life. That's it's a, uh, the thing you just want, you, you would have ah. some stress. Audible. Ah, I like it. Audible. I I so wish I could listen to Audible. I've got, I think, 15 books you know, on backlog because if I just never, I, I like start to fall asleep. I like, I got to read the real book. Like I'm trying to ah. drive down the road for 30 minutes and do it. And I'm like, next thing I know, I'm like, I don't even know what the hell just happened. I'm like half and half because I've ran into that before yeah. and I do still like having a physical copy, but there are some books that I want specific things from. And so audible was, is like the way that I go with that. And then if I want a hard copy, I'll go get it. But I, I'm going to say, I like both, but audible, I probably couldn't live without and Uber eats. Uber eats. Yeah, Big deal from Amazon yesterday. I had to send a text message to my family because my, especially my two older boys are in high school and, you know, you look at their little, they got their own little cards. They got to go make some money. We'll put some money in there, but it's this damn Grubhub, you know, whatever the fee is to do Grubhub at Amazon prime members, they just uh, took a little stake in Grubhub. So you get some free deliveries from Grubhub as an Amazon prime member. Yeah, well, maybe I'll need to download some Grubhub because I also <laughs> have Amazon prime. So yeah, there you go. You get some free food delivered to you. That was the worth right there. The price of being on the circuit of success, which is nothing yeah. other than your time. And now you're thinking, why in the hell did I do that? Anyway, where do our listeners find more of Lauren Johnson? So you can actually, the best way is to go to my website, which is laurenjohnsonandco.com. And that's spelled out A-N-D-C-O.com. Um, all my social media handles on there. You can check out my latest events on there. And you have one uh, coming have up in November, right? Yes, we have one coming up in November. This is for mental performance coaches. So people in the field of sport and performance psychology or those interested in the field, working in the field. And we bring together some of the most incredible people that are currently in the field and fields that should, that support it. Meaning like, again, grad school does not teach you business. So we bring in some really great business experts and things that actually help you to do the work in the field. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we will put all that in the show notes. I'm sure there'll be a link that you can share and we'll put that in the show notes as well. And people will connect with you, but uh, Lauren, you're a rock star. Thanks so much for being with us on the circuit of success. I've enjoyed our time together. Hey, thanks so much for having me. This was a blast.